One thing about the heart is everything else takes a break except for the heart. The heart continuously beats for your entire life. The heart never rests. And Dr. Anderson is just the same way. He is steady throughout his whole career. He's one of the most renowned cardiologists in this country and recognized all around the world. Dr. Anderson is clearly one of the research giants in Intermountain. Um, in the years he's been here, the things he's accomplished are remarkable. In the 1970s, we treated heart attacks with uh, bed rest and with oxygen, perhaps an anticoagulant, but uh, that had nothing to do with the blockage of the coronary artery that was occurring to cause the heart attack. But we had very bright, interested scientists and researchers who wanted to figure it out. And so they would come up with ideas and then test the idea. Jeff uh, at LDS Hospital uh, in the very early days of his career really transformed the way heart attacks were managed. Uh, the idea was, well, maybe you could open the artery up by dripping a clot buster drug into the artery, dissolving that clot. But nobody had done a controlled study to really see uh, how much of an impact it would have, how safe it would be. Uh, and so we decided we'd do it. And where did we get funding? The Intermountain Research and Medical Foundation. We did the first randomized study in the world uh, of that to show benefit. And now that is the cornerstone of treatment for heart attacks. It's the cornerstone and it began uh, here at uh, LDS Hospital. I think it's very easy for people to fall into a pattern, but I think research forces people out of those patterns, makes them, to, makes them look at new facts, at new developments, and maybe rethink how they're, how they're approaching old problems. The goal and scope of the artificial heart research that was done on so many animals over so many years was to ultimately use the device in human beings. It had taken us a long time to get FDA approval to put the artificial heart in a patient. Many will remember the name of Dr. Barney Clark. He was actually my patient who went through these drug treatments. And then after those uh, seemed no longer to be effective, he was referred up for what was a pioneering, groundbreaking experiment, really. I first met Dr. Barney Clark in about October 1982, when he came to Salt Lake City to visit his consulting cardiologist, Dr. Jeff Anderson. And he constantly said, that this device may not do much for me, but maybe I will help someone else in the future. He contributed so much as a pioneer, and even though for him it didn't really provide long-acting benefit, as an experiment it showed the possibility of, of assisting uh, the heart with uh, mechanical support, and now that's uh, evolved from a great big huge device to these very small units called left ventricular assist devices. The doctor found something unusual about my heartbeat, and they did an EKG, and after that they said, you know, you've got an uh, irregular heartbeat, we need to have you go to a specialist. So I proceeded to go in and make an appointment with Dr. Anderson. One very common heart rhythm problem uh, is atrial fibrillation. Five million Americans have this, uh, and we believe there's a strong genetic component 
And in some families, it can begin very early in life, even in the teens and 20s, instead of in the 70s and 80s. When Dr. Anderson saw that I had it and saw that my father had it, they asked if they could do a study on our family, a genetic study. And what we found is that me and my sister have it. And they said it would be about 50%. So in our family, it was 50%. So from my sister's side, they uh, continued to test. And they found out that two of her children of the five actually had atrial fib. We've uh, uh, been collecting uh, DNA through blood samples for over 20 years from patients, waiting for the opportunity to use that to predict disease uh, in families as well as overall and then perhaps target treatment for them, understand better what's going on. I think there's always a fear that atrial fib could cause your death, but there's also new procedures. One of the ways they can treat uh, atrial fibrillation is through an ablation. It's where they actually go in and make some incisions into your arteries and put some catheters in and go inside your heart with a little burning device and put some scar tissue so it prevents the electrical from shorting out. And it's been very successful, 70-75% in most individuals that have atrial fib. And 18 months ago, I had that, and uh, I have not had any issues or problems with my heart since. Well, my husband and I uh, had a difficult time becoming pregnant. And so when we found out that we were, uh, it was one of the most joyous days that I can ever remember. My health was great. Really, it was textbook. In my eighth month of pregnancy, I contracted the flu, and it just seemed to me to be getting worse. And about four o'clock in the middle of the night, I said, there's something seriously wrong with me. I knew that I needed medical attention. People started to look at me and take my vital signs. I knew that something was really wrong. People were starting to run in and out of the room, started to hook me up to more and more um, equipment. And at that point, uh, the doctor came in and said, uh, Allison, you're a very sick young lady. Um, we have to do some more testing, but you might need to make some decisions today. We need to think about saving you or the baby. I was young, I was uh, ready to have this incredible child in our life and couldn't believe what was happening to me. It didn't seem real. They took me to ICU. They said, Allison, you have what's called peripartum cardiomyopathy and right now you're in heart failure. The heart muscle just uh, becomes weak and, and stops functioning normally. There's about a 50-50 chance that they can return their heart function back to pretty much normal, but the other 50% don't and they can go on uh, and develop severe heart failure, even die, and unfortunately, Allison was in that latter group. This was our first child, and it was very emotional to think that there was such a grave situation that was happening around us. All I wanted to do was fight for life, and fight for my life, and fight for the unborn child that I was carrying. We wanted to root for somebody. So I remember finding out through an ultrasound that we were having a little boy and immediately his name was Benjamin. We made the decision with the doctors that it was time to have this baby. I couldn't believe that the most beautiful baby that I had ever seen was in my arms. He made it and I made it. Allison was fortunate to even survive through delivery uh, and then there was a, a real concern that she might not make it to from there. We were able to get her stabilized get her through that first year with medicines and uh, then a defibrillator to prevent her heart from having a cardiac arrest. I was able to live in heart failure for six years before I needed to take the next step um, to having a heart transplant. We're warming up and, and I remember uh, looking over at the guy next to me that was warming up with me. And I just looked at him and I shook my head and I said, I feel tired. I'm going to go sit down on the chairs over there for a minute. And I remember starting to turn and falling flat on my face. And then I realized that I couldn't breathe. You know, it just flashed through my mind that my dad had had a heart attack at the age of 43 and didn't survive it. And, and I remember hearing someone say, he's not breathing. His heart stopped. And the first thing that went through my mind was my wife and my kids, that they need me here. And 
And according to the people that were there, I had, they had done about 20 minutes of CPR and that they had shocked me about eight times. And the amazing thing for me about all that was when I had turned to fall, I had actually fallen down at the feet of the only guy in the gym that knew how to do CPR. Dr. Anderson and Dr. Muehlstein took my case. We went to the laboratory, my colleague Dr. Muehlstein uh, recognized that it was a blockage of his main artery, opened it back up based on uh, this principle of reperfusion that I mentioned, went back to the early 80s, only now we're doing it mechanically instead of with drugs like streptokinase. Statistically, I shouldn't be here. The, really, it's, it's a miracle that I'm here. Only 4% of people actually survive that heart attack if they get into surgery within half an hour. I feel like Dr. Anderson saved my life. I got a family to take care of. And I'm very grateful for Dr. Anderson. He always, when he came to see him at the hospital, he always says, you are a miracle. You are a miracle. Research work on some of the devices we've developed are saving lives. We couldn't have done the research we've done without the support of Intermountain Research and Medical Foundation. Really, we're just on the verge of a whole new era, as I can see, understanding better the mechanisms of disease through not only genetics, but the expression of the genes and can really practice what we now call precision medicine. There's no place that's in a better position to do that than at Intermountain. One of the great hallmarks of our foundation has been our support of research. It's not about need. It hasn't been about need. It's about opportunity. It's about vision. They're going to take those dollars and put them to great use. Together, we're going to touch many lives. Our hope and my hope is that we can continue on this path with research, understanding, genetic study, so that we, again, can find a cure for our children. You know, I'm glad that we're on this journey together and that Dr. Anderson is in the same boat with us. <laughs> He's a hard worker. He's uh, humble to a fault. Um, and when you're, when you're around Jeff, you know you're gonna learn something. He is a renaissance man for the past 10 years. He has been significantly involved in writing the guidelines that everybody in the world follows. The American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology cardiovascular guidelines. And he is the leader of that, not only is he a fabulous clinician, scientist, and scholar? He is a tremendous musician. His instrument was the violin, but his wife's was the viola. But the violinists don't sit by the violas. So he took up the viola and got good enough to get into the orchestra at Temple Square, which is a professional orchestra, so he could sit by his wife and play together. Talk about a romantic story. I've had two heart transplants. Dr. Anderson prolonged my life um, and my original heart. The advancement that, that researchers like Dr. Anderson have been able to do has been life-saving in my case. He's my other half, I know. We have a second chance. I just feel very grateful for this.